So we hear the Lenaro Connect uh, here in Vancouver. And uh, hi, so who are you? Hi, I'm Tom Yuli from UC San Diego and Renaissance Robotics. So um, uh, we're looking here at the famous uh, MIP, right? Uh, so this is called EduMip. So this is an educational version of a toy that we came to market with, uh, with uh, Huawei, um, called the MIP, which was a highly successful toy, um, consumer toy, fun to play with, had a fun place back. Um, and uh, this version, uh, a student can assemble from a kit, uh, can model the dynamics, um, which is, of course, unstable, segue-like dynamics, falls over unless you have the right kind of feedback, then learn how to program the little computer on it uh, in order to stabilize it, and then once you figure out how to connect the cyber to the physical, uh, you can uh, then extend this and build a lot of fun things. Uh, so uh, right here, the Lenara Connect, you, you're talking about uh, uh, a new version of it that yes. has 96 board support? Yes, exactly. So we're working on version 2 um, of, uh, of this now. Um, and so as you see here, um, we've uh, developed a, uh, a, a universal mount. Um, and so now the EduMip um, in this new version um, can fit um, anything in the 96 boards format. And here we have uh, the Dragon Board 410C based on Qualcomm chips. Um, and uh, of course, there's a rich family uh, of boards in the 96 boards um, ecosystem uh, built uh, largely on uh, um, cell phone technology, so cutting edge processors. Um, 10 times more powerful than the Cray 2 is a, a quote that I like to use, which is the fastest supercomputer in the world when, when I was an undergraduate. And now people have 10 Cray 2s running at about a watt um, on these modern processors. Uh, and so there's a lot that can be done. So uh, it's an exciting time to be getting into robotics. So uh, this one is a Beagle? Yes. And so the original uh, product that we came to, uh, to market with, you can buy them on Renaissance uh, Press, uh, Renaissance Robotics, sorry. Um, so, um, the, the original um, uh, kit that we developed um, was built around the BeagleBone Blue. Um, and the BeagleBone Blue was developed um, in uh, collaboration between our lab at UCSD um, and the good folks at BeagleBoard.org. Um, and so it essentially fused together all of the key components of the BeagleBone Black, which is a highly popular credit card size Linux computer, um, together with um, all of the, um, the power electronics and uh, H bridges and breakouts for motors and encoders and, and all of the individual buses together with IMUs um, and the battery uh, management um, ICs um, all together on a single board um, and it uh, integrates a, uh, a SIP, so Octavo Systems put together the Cetera processor that was at the, the core of the BeagleBone Black together with some memory and some power management ICs uh, into a very small footprint, uh, allowing us enough room to put all of this other uh, uh, functionality together on a single board. We're only using a very small fraction of that capability uh, in a MIP, of course. We're taking two motors and two encoders onto this board. Um, but uh, once you learn how to, uh, to do this, um, you can uh, extend to much more complicated vehicles, which is uh, what we use this for, is to introduce um, how to do motor control and feedback. And uh, uh, what's the advantage of having something much more powerful, potentially? So um, it's exciting uh, to be moving into the 96 boards family because uh, now we can use uh, processors that are custom designed for <coughs> uh, advanced cell phones um, in order to uh, pull in 4K video uh, and uh, have built-in uh, DSPs and uh, uh, GPUs. And so we can uh, do on, uh, on the vehicle, so edge computing, if you like, um, we can uh, uh, do object recognition um, and we can do face detection and, and we can uh, uh, really do all of the advanced things that a uh, um, that uh, in a modern cell phone can do. Uh, the idea is to integrate that into our small robotic systems. And again, this is just a test platform that we're showing here. You learn how to use these things here and then you can extend to larger systems from there. A for instance, that is, uh, is kind of cool. Um, so uh, um, a robot like this um, can fall off the edge of a table. I think playing at the dinner table is an interesting, or a restaurant on the table is an interesting place to play. So one of my goals is to do automatic edge detection so the vehicle can run around on the table, but it can stay away from edges and keep from falling off the table. And so that sort of thing requires vision processing. So as it moves around, it can recognize the boundary of its play area. And it could also be interesting to have access to all these new AI, uh, neural networking kind Absolutely. of accelerators. Yeah. I think in the future, we're going to see that there will be two types of toys. Those that 
recognize your face when you come in and can greet you by name and those that don't. And so really um, using some of these uh, modern uh, cell phone technology um, in robotic toys and so they can interact with you and even detect your mood and, and, uh, and play with you um, is uh, um, going to be a very uh, uh, interesting aspect of, uh, uh, of how toys evolve in the future. Because uh, this, this toy, I mean, uh, educational toy right here, mm -hmm. uh, when I see it move like this, it makes me uh, think that maybe it has some kind of feelings or something. Yeah. Uh, so you want to you want to you want to have the next you know like uh, the smart speaker kind of into, like uh, the next kind of AI thing where they suddenly you know, give them a uh, some it, kind of soul or what do you call it? Yeah. So th so that's why I think um, the uh, the Huawei toy MIP um, was a breakout success when it first came out a few years ago. Um, was. Uh, the dynamics of the, the the motion make it feel organic, makes it feel alive, just from the fact that if you give it a push, it has to adjust to, to stay upright, um, gives it a sense of life, uh, liveliness, um, that you don't get in just a statically stable toy sitting on the ground. Um, and so coupling that together then with the advanced features of uh, vision recognition and uh, um, so facial recognition um, and um, also uh, communication, voice communication, um, and even detection of maybe how you might be feeling that day if you're feeling direct or if you're feeling shy or, or sad and be able to uh, interact with emotion. Uh, that's uh, one of the exciting things that uh, we're able to explore now with, uh, with AI algorithms, being able to, uh, to really detect mood and uh, understand context. And, and that's a really exciting direction to go. So uh, this, this uh, you, the M -E M -I -P stands for? Yes, Mobile Inverted Pendulum. So it's a technical word for what's going on in a little Segway-like system. So it's kind of like the Segway um, concept, yes. right? Yeah. And and uh, but how does this, this kind of algorithm work on all these different boards? Yeah. So the core algorithm here is is straightforward. And so in the undergraduate controls curriculum at UCSD, on um, the capstone class that kind of tops that all, all off is a embedded control and robotics class where uh, undergraduates each buy this kit on. Um, for uh, about $130 uh, for everything that you see balancing here, puts it together and, and understands how to uh, close an inner loop and an outer loop. Essentially, the inner loop keeps it stabilized around a, uh, a nominal angle, and then the outer loop adjusts that angle to keep the thing from running forward or backwards. And so the inner loop and the outer loop are essentially um, PID controllers, so straightforward controllers. We tweak them to be a little better. Um, and um, then uh, the whole uh, system is then put together by coordinating these inner loops and outer loops uh, together to control the whole vehicle. Um, and then you have other loops going on simultaneously that take care of other um, items. You might have remote control from your phone driving the thing around, uh, giving information much more slowly as to reference uh, waypoints to, to, to move to. Um, and so the, the algorithms, the, the control algorithms, are, are in our uh, undergraduate controls curriculum at UCSD, as I said. Um, a number of other schools um, have uh, picked up and begun uh, using um, this platform. Um, so uh, at UCSD, the original course that we developed, you program the, the little Linux board there, the BeagleBone Blue, in C. Um, and uh, so other popular software packages uh, include ROS, the robot operating system, and so is Lewis Whitcomb uh, uh, at Johns Hopkins University uh, developed a class uh, around the um, uh, using ROS to, to control a system like this. Uh, Mauricio de Oliveira um, developed uh, a class um, using uh, Python to control the same vehicle. Um, and uh, so what's nice is to be part of a much larger community uh, where you have friends and colleagues um, at uh, uh, multiple universities um, um, expressing their own creative uh, vision of what you can do uh, with small boards and small platforms that are affordable for systems to own, for, for students to own, um, and uh, developing new educational uh, curriculum around it. And so that's kind of nice thing about this meeting um, is here we're developing, uh, we're, we're meeting a lot of people who are uh, developing around this 96 boards format. Um, and so what I uh, um, am working on the, the folks here at this meeting with is this next generation board. And again, we're we're making universal mount here, um, and so we can mount anything from a, a beagle bone like we have done before um, to a Raspberry Pi. So you notice this is a, a Raspberry Pi, um, and this is um, the uh, Dragonboard 410C in the 
six boards format. Um, and so um, what we're working on is the daughter boards um, for um, these other processors, so the, 90, the um, Raspberry Pi format and the 96 boards format, and also a standalone single board um, based on an ARM Cortex uh, M3. Um, so um, when you want to prototype, one of the challenges that we've seen in my lab um, is uh, that if you develop initial lab prototype on a low-cost um, BeagleBone or Raspberry Pi, and then you either want to scale up to something much more powerful uh, that incorporates um, 4K vision, or you want to scale down uh, to something that you can embed in a low-cost toy, you often have to start from scratch. And so the vision here um, is that um, we're developing uh, a family of, uh, of boards, and so we can be more platform agnostic. We can do our initial lab prototypes on some low-cost uh, community boards that a lot of people use, and then as we scale up to uh, some more powerful system, or we scale down to a low-cost system, which might be initially harder to program, but uh, can be something that eventually can go into a much more low-cost uh, toy, um, we can use that initial code base that we develop on our initial lab prototypes and be able to port them over because our hardware uh, will be on the, uh, the same hardware on, on the daughter boards mounted uh, on these other platforms um, and the software. Um, so all of these that I have on the table here are Linux boards. Um, the next in, in the line will be the, the low cost board that will be on a ARM Cortex M3 or M4 that um, is a lightweight target that can't handle running Linux and so it's running a real time operating system or an RTOS. So we're developing a, uh, a library that's portable across this entire range of boards, from these Linux boards uh, to these more advanced Linux boards and all the way down to a lightweight target running an Artos, and that's running the robot control library um, developed by my PhD student James Strassen. And we're, uh, with that library now is well tuned for the, the BeagleBone, and so what we're gonna do is work towards porting those across this entire family, and so you get both hardware and software portability as you develop prototypes. So I like to say from, uh, from prototyped to product, and so we can streamline that whole workflow. Um, and based on my experience, the, the challenge of getting from the initial lab prototype to the production prototype, um, that's what we're trying to streamline through this process. So uh, 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 what if, uh, let's say, there's another 96 board that comes out that has a super powerful CPU and all this neural networking and AI yeah. and stuff. Uh, the, the good thing about this kind of balancing, for example, uh, and the segues, is that they kind of adjust for to any kind of weight, right? So you can yeah. just plug in another one in, and then uh, load the software, and it will just work. The yes. motors and everything is so, going to be so. So, so a couple enough. of aspects to that. So, so first of all, working uh, in a standards compliant way like this, uh, and so BeagleBone, Raspberry Pi, and the whole family of 96 boards are three very common standards. Uh, and so, if you uh, and especially talking about the 96 boards uh, standard, uh, there are many, many, many boards that are in this format and more to come. Um, and so, if you work in a standards compliant way uh, across these boards, uh, then as these new boards come out. Uh, um, you can take your uh, your, your um, daughter board off of your 410C and put it on the new Dragon board, uh, whatever it is that's that's coming out, um, and then you can use all of its uh, more advanced features. The other thing uh, to mention uh, related to your comment about changing of mass distribution, um, we are working on uh, a new set of uh, of adapters um, that um, you could, uh, for instance, mount um, a uh, a weight that you can put on top of it. So the idea is that um, you could uh, um, be balancing something like this um, and um, then say, what happens if the mass suddenly changes? So whenever I show these things at a conference, somebody always uh, asks, have you developed the um, the robot that can get a beer from the kitchen for me? Um, and uh, so it's always said as something of a joke, but there's, uh, there, there's uh, an interesting question there. Uh, and so the first question, if it's a balancing robot, is yes, you're changing the mass distribution significantly when you put a beer on top of this thing. Um, and so a certain type of control algorithm is needed, one which is adaptive, that recognizes the change in overall mass and mass distribution, and adapts the control system accordingly uh, in order to keep it from balancing now that its weight distribution has changed. Um, and so we're developing um, a, uh, an extension, a, a number of 
of different extensions, but uh, you know, one of the, the first extensions that we're developing is simply something which is a beer can holder for the top of this thing. Um, and so you can put a mass on that and then you can tune your control algorithms and so they can adapt for moving mass on and off of this thing. Because um, the dream is, as they are, the questions are in the conferences and stuff like that, uh, is to have the, the MIP uh, bring you the beer, right? Right. And so um, if that dream is to be realized, that's a fun dream. If that dream is to be realized, we're going to have to have, in addition to uh, a good uh, beer carrying robot, um, we're going to have to have the custom fridge uh, that uh, might be some adaptation of the, uh, um, of the sort of uh, uh, vending machine uh, that you see uh, in, in uh, uh, commercial sites, uh, but at the home scale. Uh, so something that in the doorway um, you can load in a, a bunch of, uh, of um, 12 ounce cans um, and then you can select uh, using your Alexa, say, Alexa, get me a beer. Um, Alexa um, triggers the, uh, um, the, the refrigerator to pull out whichever your favorite uh, beer flavor is um, and it comes down through through a chute down to the, uh, uh, the the bottom and the vehicle goes over and grabs it from that chute and and then drives it out uh, to, to the living room so I think that's actually doable I don't think that's that far off um, the uh, the idea of vending machines that can manage keeping drinks cold and selecting one um, is the well-established technology, um, building robots that can balance is well-established and, and uh, certainly being able to carry a load of that size is not a problem at all. So I think that's near term. If anybody is interested in pursuing that, please uh, come to UCSD and uh, we can work on that together. <laughs> I can imagine there's, you, you have a lot of students already that are yes. very interested in your, in your, in your uh, projects here, yeah. but if you also have the beer, that might be even more Even more so, yes. That so, would want to sign up, so when, uh, it would when, be including the beer, right? <laughs> there you go, free beer, <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, so at UCSD, um, one of the ways I, uh, uh, I, I manage that, uh, that, that strong interest um, is uh, we have a, uh, an organized uh, academic program um, and uh, so as we go through this, this, this program, the, there is a uh, class um, in the fall quarter senior year uh, called Embedded Control and Robotics, uh, where you actually go through this exercise of learning how to multi-thread, uh, so write a program with multiple different threads in Linux or uh, now in an Artos, um, and uh, to connect a discrete time record controller with a continuous time unstable system um, and coordinate all of the different things in order to get the communication between the threads in order to put all this together. Once you get through that, then I welcome those undergraduates in to do undergraduate research or to stay for a master's degree um, and take it to the next level. So um, uh, one of my uh, uh, very talented students uh, uh, um, put a uh, um, put a spinning uh, PCB on top of um, one of these units, um, and uh, um, it had a row of, uh, of LEDs, uh, uh, closely spaced LEDs across it, and if you spin it faster than about 40 hertz, um, then your eyes blur it together. It's called the persistence of vision effect, POV. Um, and so, for instance, if you uh, make all of those lights yellow and you turn them on for 300 degrees and off for 60 degrees and on and off then it would make for instance a Pac-Man. Um, so you can make other uh, other characters um, and uh, so for instance um, that uh, that group of students um, ha uh, the idea was to uh, uh, have a bunch of MIPS running around in a little maze uh, with little uh, persistence of vision uh, heads um, that are spinning around. So looking from above, you could have characters chasing around each other in a maze, just like in a video game. Uh, so that's one sort of thing that uh, you can do. You can, of course, print shells. So one of my students was uh, was uh, challenged to uh, to pr print out, 3D print, um, some uh, some very compelling shells for the thing. And he designed a uh, an Easter Island head. So, you know, the uh, the heads that uh, that are facing the ocean on Easter Island. So he built uh, a head that fits on this. Um, and uh, so we had those running around. Um, uh, we've also built a, a, a version that is telepresence, and so it has um, speakers and microphones and, uh, uh, and um, a screen on it so they can run around and you can have a conversation with somebody remotely. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of cool spin-off projects that, that come out of this, and uh, uh, it's really fun to watch uh, what, uh, what students come up with with their creativity. And these students are building the robots for the future. Yes, they um, all get get out of this. Uh, eventually, get jobs in the robotics. Some of them, or yes, and like in that? the toy industry, and uh, and at all the the people trying to enter the uh, the smart home market. And so there's uh, um, 
like I said, a, a, an incredible growth of the possibility now that we have uh, low-cost cell phone technology. As I said, 10 Cray 2s um, in your pocket um, now is the technology that drives these little systems running around. And so a lot of interesting stuff can be done. So now is a great time to get into robotics. Um, one of the uh, interesting applications um, is elder, elder care. Uh, so um, something that can uh, go around and, uh, and help out um, your, your, your grandparents in their home, keep them out of a, an assisted living community for five more years and keep them at home. They want to be there, but sometimes they need help during the day. Something that can um, uh, help them around the home, uh, pick up their uh, uh, keys, or um, um, make sure that uh, they haven't fallen and call for help if they have, monitor things, make sure they take their medicines. Um, and so um, using robotics uh, both for fun, for, for, for kids, but also uh, for care, uh, so to have a companion uh, that is lifelike and fuzzy, um, but also uh, can do practical things around the house um, is a very interesting place to be. You can also use uh, robots for security, for, for monitoring uh, um, things. Um, so just an incredible number of, of applications. Uh, precision agriculture is another place where we can uh, use them to evaluate every plant um, on a day-by-day -day basis to see what kind of uh, water and fertilizer and pesticide uh, they, they might need uh, individually, plant by plant, across a field. Um, and then both the uh, um, planting and, and harvesting, so soft grippers made from uh, uh, 3D printable um, soft material like thermoplastic polyurethane that can pick strawberries. I mean, there's just an incredible number of applications where I think we're going to be able to use robotics. And so, yes, uh, this is uh, really a, a actively growing field and a lot of interesting things to do. And on the screen you were showing a PCB. Yes, um, so I wanted to, uh, to give uh, an idea of this. Uh, so. Um, this is um, the daughter board that uh, we're building. This is the Raspberry Pi version. Um, and so um, as we um, work towards uh, getting the Raspberry Pi and the, the, the boards in the 96 boards format, uh, being able to uh, drive um, small robotic systems in a platform agnostic way to give us portability from, uh, from the low cost consumer boards to the higher end boards or, or the, the, the lower cost uh, consumer toys. Um, this, I think, is going to be our, our tool to, uh, to, to make that porting. And so um, this is a board um, that is going to bring up to uh, 12 amps of, uh, of power onto the board uh, through a little XD30 connector on the bottom. Um, and uh, then we'll have uh, uh, JST breakouts for eight motors at up to 2.5 amps apiece. Um, and breakouts for eight encoders, all the standard buses, and uh, 10 servos or ESCs. Of course, we'll have an IMU on here and uh, a barometer um, and uh, all, a lot of power conditioning to handle 12 volts from a uh, two cell or three cell or four cell LiPo. Um, and, uh, sorry, 12 amps, two cell, three cell or four cell LiPo, so six volts up to 18 volts. So we're regulating all that power as it comes on board and distributing appropriately, sending a little bit of power down to the microprocessor and shipping the rest of the power off to the, uh, the, the motors, the servos. Um, and the other components that you'd be connecting to. Um, and uh, so there'll be a small microprocessor on there controlling all of the supplemental features on here. And again, the idea of this board um, is to have a version for the Raspberry Pi, a version for the 96 boards, a version for the BeagleBone, and a standalone um, based on a low cost processor. And so you can port across these whole families um, and then once you um, have designed the prototype, then you can take our schematic dial down to only the components that you need for whatever product you're taking to market, um, and then you can uh, accelerate the idea from uh, the, the, the prototype to the, to, to the product that you actually make. So, so uh, and so that adds a whole bunch of more kind of uh, sensibilities to the to the robot. Yes, or? and and so um, here again, we're only driving two uh, um, <coughs> low power motors and and reading two quadrature encoders and low speed. The idea here um, is that we have uh, and we can drive eight high power motors up to 2.5 amps, 18 volts. So we're doing <laughs> uh, 100 watts of of energy going into uh, uh, these uh, th these motors. Um, and uh, um, you can even double these up, and so you can put uh, uh, you can put um, into each motor. Sorry, um, uh, six to eighteen volts at two point five amps. You double them up, you can go five amps. Um, so that's up to uh, 
um, 60 watts of power in each of these motors. And so you can build a large format 3D printer or a large pick and place machine. Um, so this uh, can be used directly embedded into products, um, but you can also use this to prototype for those products and then scale down getting rid of the um, other things that you don't need if you're scaling up to a large system. Um, you can also build a, a quadcopter with uh, with this sort of thing or a multi-rotor with, with more rotors. Um, so the idea is to build a multifunction board that is an easy starting point and is portable across platforms. Because uh, this is the awesome MIP, but you've, you've done a whole bunch of other stuff, right? Yeah, and so uh, so actually the, uh, the the base of this thing um, is uh, is actually taken from the assembly line. While we was gracious enough to uh, uh, let us uh, buy a few of these off the assembly line, so this is toy grade, um, and by that I I mean something pretty amazing that a two year old can have a temper tantrum with this wheelbase and it still works. And uh, that I speak from experience. My two year old Zachary um, had uh, uh, emotional moments where this thing went flying across the room and hit the wall, um, and the MIP still worked. And uh, so if you just uh, take a motor and gearbox and bolt a wheel to it, um, and then you throw it in your backpack and you take it out, um, some percentage of the time that uh, that motor shaft is going to bend and it's not, just not going to work. But this thing has a load bearing and output shaft and uh, has very strong, has the right amount of flexibility and so this is a really robust uh, base. And so uh, we started from that and we use this as a teaching mechanism but the idea of this uh, EduMIP platform is once you get it working and understand it, take it apart and do something else with it. You know, so you use this as a tool to learn how to um, connect uh, the cyber to the physical and to, to write to motors using PWMs and to read what the motors are doing using quadrature encoders to communicate to an IMU over I2C bus or an SPI bus um, and then to uh, really uh, build out the system from there to connect to as many other uh, motors or servos or ESCs that you have in your system in order to build an arm and, and extend from there. And it's only $50 without the board? Yes, the, the kit itself is fifty dollars at uh, Renaissance Robotics, um, and then the, the the board is seventy eight. So for one hundred twenty eight dollars, this seventy eight, and get this that. could be a different um, price. Yeah, this so, so the, price. this is going to be a, a different price. But again, we're going to have much more uh, capable uh, board. So this version two of this. Uh, uh, of this line uh, is going to be able to uh, drive, like I said, pulling up to 12 amps onto the board. Um, we're going to be able to drive high power motors in order to build uh, large format 3D printers, um, pick and place machines, um, robots that have many uh, um, actuators on them, maybe a, an arm to pick something up. Um, and so, uh, so, so really we're, we're trying to scale up now to, to give a, a next level of capability in this, this new generation. And you working with stair climbing robots? Yes. Let me uh, I, let me show a couple of pictures on, uh, on just uh, giving some ideas of directions we're going. Uh, so you mentioned the stair climbing one. That uh, I have a picture of that here. Um, yeah. So the um, stair climbing. Oops. Let me uh, increase the size on that. Um, so the stair climbing robot is uh, is indicated here. Um, so this is a, a project being led by uh, Daniel Yang, um, and uh, so this is a MIP, two wheels, but it uh, has a third motor, um, and so the body can lift itself up this leg in the middle, um, and so it can end over in. I like to call it the inverse slinky maneuver, uh, and so um, it segues up to a stairway, plants its leg, pulls its body up the leg, leans over onto the step, self-uprights onto that step, and then does the same maneuver uh, up the uh, additional steps in order to climb up the stairs. So we're, we're working on what's the minimalist machine that can uh, be wheel driven, which is, uh, which is fast and uh, robust to make in an engineering setting as opposed to legged locomotion, which is much more complicated and difficult, interesting, um, but a, 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 a different problem. So we're working on wheeled robots and the minimalist wheeled robot that can climb stairs um, efficiently and quickly. And so the idea, that's the idea behind this stair climbing robot. Um, again, uh, a segue like motion, uh, driving around quickly on two wheels uh, and then doing uh, a, a stair climbing climbing maneuver um, using uh, a third motor in order to do the lifting. Um, and the idea of this is it would be 
possible to use this as a throwbot. Um, so one of the, the, the robots that I'm really impressed with um, is the Recon Scout. Um, so it's a, uh, a robot that is used by the, uh, the, the military and security forces, um, something that you can throw over uh, a brick wall or toss down the stairs. Um, and um, it's essentially two wheels on a toilet paper tube, tube uh, durable. Uh, and so the folks at Recon Robotics have done uh, a, uh, um, have a great job on that. Um, and so the idea of this is to add one motor to that sort of design. And so in addition to being a tube with two wheels and, and an antenna, we have the lift mechanism uh, through the center of this thing. And so we can not just fall downstairs, but we can climb upstairs. So stairs are integral in the human environment. Um, and uh, being able to negotiate stairs uh, with something which is robust and lightweight and small um, is the name of the game. And that's what we're pursuing with this effort. And uh, um, you've, you've also had uh, like a tank kind of uh, that can... Yes, and uh, so we've worked on balancing uh, robots. Uh, if you look up uh, the switchblade robot, I'll not bring it up here, but if you uh, uh, look up the switchblade robot on, on YouTube, you'll find something developed by Nick Morozowski, uh, which was uh, uh, one of our early designs uh, that uh, uh, is uh, a treaded sort of vehicle where you can drive the treads around the arms and independently you can drive the arms relative to the body. Um, and so uh, Switchblade was the um, first treaded robot that could get up and stand on its toes effectively. And then it could flip the body up. And so we use feedback control in order to extend the reach of a small vehicle. Um, uh, and so you take a look at the Switchblade robot and you'll see something like that. And there have been spinoffs of, uh, of, of that general idea um, in recent years as well. Um, so the switchblade uh, design is, is one. Let me mention one further, uh, further design that we're working at. So of course everybody's interested in drones. We have our own take on the, the drone idea. Um, and so um, this is a project uh, that's also been led by, uh, by James Strassen. Um, and uh, so this project is a hexacopter. So a lot of people fly quadcopters. Um, and so uh, the idea of a, of a quadcopter um, is by um, turning, uh, so you have two propellers that spin clockwise, two propellers that spin counterclockwise. Um, so you have uh, uh, four rotors there. Two of them are mounted in the front, two of them are mounted in the back. Um, and so by independently controlling each of the rotors uh, through what's called a mixing matrix, you can have independent control of pitch, roll, yaw, and lift. So you have control of four things in a quadcopter. Um, and, uh, but you're moving in a six degree of freedom uh, uh, world, and so the two things that you're missing um, is direct side force. Um, so you can't move like this in a quadcopter. To move sideways, um, you have to roll and then lift. Um, to move forward, um, you have to pitch and then lift. Uh, and so, um, in a quadcopter, you have those six degrees of, uh, of freedom and individual control of four of those, and so you have to put them together uh, in order to maneuver. Uh, now, what's interesting is to make quadcopters small um, and to put a little camera on the bottom. Quadcopters are often used for flying selfie sticks. So look at me in my environment, surfing or skiing or in the park with my dog or whatever it is. Um, and um, the challenge is that if you're maneuvering to hold position, you have to have a little gimbal uh, keeping the camera on the target. And so you're adding complexity by putting that mechanical gimbal on there. And so instead, what we do with this hexacopter design um, is we uh, take the rotors and we change their orientation. So we have six rotors, and so we've worked through a mathematical algorithm to optimize their orientations. And so we now have individual control of all six degrees of freedom. So in addition to um, pitch, roll, yaw, and lift, we have independent control of direct side force um, in the two sideways directions. So now even if it's windy outside, we can maintain our station while keeping the camera on targets because we can uh, directly control the vehicle in all directions that it might be get uh, might get uh, blown off. Um, and so um, this is an interesting design. Um, that idea was originally introduced by Sci-Fi Works um, on a design that they uh, they proposed on Kickstarter. It actually never came to market, um, but then the, the, the company reinvented itself uh, sometime later. <coughs> but uh, we have um, taken that design um, and um, optimized uh, the rotor angles, so we came up with different angles than they did. Uh, that gives some more efficient control of each of the, uh, the, the directions of the degrees of freedom. And so a plan here is that we're starting with this line of vehicles uh, that are just uh, minimalist vehicles to learn how to connect 
uh, small computers to, uh, to to wheels to drive around and, and balance. Uh, but we're working towards making a line of educational vehicles, and this will be one in that line of learning how to do um, six degree of freedom control with a with a hexacopter. And this could potentially also have different boards. Yes, and so we're working on a design for this. So this universal mount that we developed, you might uh, want to blow in on that. Um, so that um, can uh, accept uh, a, a Beagle Bone, a Raspberry Pi, or anything in the 96 boards format. And so the way we've accomplished that is by putting little washers neck underneath the mount holes that we were using and de designing the shape of this thing appropriately so it doesn't interfere with the, uh, the components on the bottom sides of the boards. Um, and so this little mount, um, we are using um, both on um, this uh, little two-wheeled edumet vehicle, uh, but we will also be using it in the uh, other line. And we'll put the uh, design files for that little universal mount on, on the web. And so if anybody else wants to use this universal mount uh, to develop their own vehicles, we're happy to share that. Because uh, this, you open to uh, grow the community. And yes, have more exactly. people around the world. Yeah. Other uh, using this stuff, the better. Yeah. It's, other uh, takes professors community to grow this stuff. Yeah. To get involved. Yes. We can uh, just buy these on the internet. Yeah. So $50. so we can we can we can buy these kits. The the, the EduMip kits are uh, easily found on the web, um, and. Uh, um, as we uh, develop these uh, version two, so we can port across all of these platforms, um, and these additional um, uh, prototypes that are uh, th that are around these, we'd like to make those uh, available nearly at cost to the community, and so we can uh, we, we can see the the good ideas that people have in the education setting, and then and then growing from there and doing cool things with them. So this is very exciting, right? Thank you. The very sure. exciting future for the. Robotics. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, I mean, robotics. we just happen to be at the right place at the right time. I mean, this uh, cell phone technology really spinning out into things that uh, that we can actually embed into vehicles that can do useful things around the home and the farm uh, for security purposes. Uh, it's uh, it's it's really interesting, um, and uh, there's there's a lot of fun that can be had with this technology. A lot of useful things that can be done to make a a, a better, safer, um, and uh, uh, compassionately, um, you know, work with others, uh, work with autistic children, work with elderly to keep them in their home. I mean, there are a lot of things that we can uh, use technology for the good now. And so this uh, sort of educational projects are really designed to um, help bring um, students who are interested in doing this um, uh, up to the cutting edge in technology.